Well, good morning, good morning. We ready? Man, after worship like that, I just need you to know I'm fired up and ready to go. So uh, we'll see where this ends up. Um, super excited. Um, I have a QR code right here. Um, this QR code is uh, the best way just to kind of follow along with my, uh, my craziness. Might give you a little bit of something to look back at later on and just go, oh, that's what we were talking about. So uh, some notes that you can fill in if, uh, along the way. Um, try to hit as many of those as I can. Um, but man, here we go. Man, we're asking the question, what does it look like as followers of Christ to live? You ready for this? with your eyes up, okay, looking, watching, waiting, anticipating. There's just one thing that you know if you attend Vantage Point uh, enough is that uh, I do. I love, I love fly fishing, all right? Uh, I'm not great at it, and I don't get to do it as much as I would like to. It's like anything else, but I love doing it. And here's the thing. What I'm learning about fly fishing is it's a little bit different um, than your typical fishing, right? Like you don't just throw like a worm on the end of a hook and just kind of throw it out somewhere and just watch the bobber kind of move up and down, right? Like, like you, you have to be a little bit more skilled and a little bit more strategic. And, but here's the reality. What, the way I fish right now um, is, is like this. Um, I, I find a good piece of moving water. Uh, I watch for bubbles because I say if there's bubbles, then there's life, and if there's life, then there's food, and if there's food, there's trout, all right? And so you find that. So you, you find the little ripples coming down. You find little pockets behind like, uh, like a, a rock, and you throw it back behind that, or you let it drift by that, uh, and, and, and hopefully big trout is waiting right there, um, and you can take him, right? So that's how I fish. That's how, that's how I do it. I just kind of, I throw and I hope. I throw and I pray. But here's what I've learned. If you're good, you spend most of your time actually finding the fish. I remember when I went uh, kind of the first time with a guide, um, I noticed that he had these really cool glasses on. And I'm like, bro, your glasses are sweet. And he's like, yeah, they help me see fish. I'm like, for real? He's like, yeah, absolutely, right? And I am thinking I'm just being gullible here. But no, for real, they really do, Right? And so we would be walking down this river and like this guide I'm with is like this. Like I'm, I'm just back there just kind of watching him and dude, his eyes are just like this. He's just watching. He'd be like, okay, stop. He said, you see that little rock out there? There's a really big trout. And I'm like, where? I don't see this. He's like, no, no, just trust me. It's there, so I need you to throw about 10 feet that way and let it drift right across. And I'm like going, bro, you were expecting a lot. And so I'd get it as close to I can and I'd be watching it kind of drift by and I'm just watching the top layer of the water and this dude is like watching the bottom because he's like, he's looking at it. He's watching it and he's, he's moving. And I'm over there going, oh my God. Like I'm nervous as can be. I'm like, dude, you're killing me. My strategy's better. He's like, get ready, get ready. He's on. And sure enough, it's like I'd come and bite it. But he knew how to watch. He spent most of his time not just throwing into emptiness, but he actually spent time like throwing where it counted. He knew what to watch for. And that's what kept him coming back because he would see him. Let me ask you a question. Are you like that guide by the river when it comes to your walk with Jesus where your eyes are just up and you're just like, God, I'm watching. God, what are you doing? How are you working? God, I want to see you. And then our eyes catch that glimpse, right? You know what I'm talking about. You've seen that. Like where your eyes actually see the movement of God, your eyes actually catch hold of like God actually doing something. And then it makes you hungry. You come back for more. Your eyes are up constantly, right? Like you're just like, I want to see it again, God. I want to see it one more time, God. Let me see it. Come on, God, show it to me. And he's like, yes, yes, my people, they want to see this stuff. And I'm going to show you great things. Man, I don't want to miss that. Do you know what to look for? Here's my simple question for you. You ready for this? Are your eyes even up? Like, are you watching? Like this past week, like, did you have moments in your day where you even had this thought of like, man, I, I want to see, God, like, what are you doing? 
But you know what? If you're anything like me, it is so easy to have great intentions for that. Like in the first 30 minutes of your day, like, man, you had a great quiet time. And it's like, whoa, go God. Man, you're going to rock it today, God. And then you lay in bed at night and you find yourself going, man, I, I didn't even like anticipate. I didn't watch. I didn't wait. I didn't. So are we? Are our eyes up ready to see? I love what Isaiah 40, 31 is kind of the foundation for this, right? But they who wait for the Lord. They usually wait for the Lord, right? Like, again, we, we, we understood that the, the first week here, right? Like, waiting there is like this anticipation. It's like this excitement. It's like the guy looking at me going, hey, get ready. He's watching it. He's looking. He's moving. And inside, you start getting the bubbles in your guts. And you're just like, ah, no. Those who wait for the Lord with that kind of excitement and anticipation, it says, shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. But all of that is contingent upon our waiting and experiencing and expecting and seeing God. Micah 7, 7. Man, Micah 7 is this. This prophet in the midst of a lot of like chaos. He says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. No, this is how we have to be if we want to see God. It's how we have to be. Man, if we want to watch God do mighty work. He wants us to see. Do we watch? Do we wait? Are we anticipating? Knowing that God is moving. So last week we had this 50,000 foot view where we just kind of, man, we were, we were just, we were coming over like this big picture of like, man, what does it look like to live with expectancy of God's power? Like, how do we live with expectancy of God's power? How do we recognize, man, God is a powerful God and he moves and he is still moving and that doesn't stop. This week, let me tell you this, you ready for this? We are getting very granular. Like we're going from 50,000 to like eyeball to eyeball, all right? Here's the question today. What does it look like to live with expectancy that God will actually work in my family? Like, what does it look like to live with expectancy that God's going, hey, I love your family, and I'm actually going to do work in it. I'm actually going to do work in your kids. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God can do work in our kids? Man, it is going to be real easy for me to make this all about kids, and I'm trying not to just make it about kids because it's about the family. But here's the reality. Men, I think sometimes we kind of have our kids and like they're six, seven, eight, and we're just kind of like, eh, you know, I'm just kind of biding time till they're like 13, 14 when they can really understand the things of God. Let me tell you something. King Josiah was eight when he became one of the most profound kings in the Old Testament. He took an Israel that was falling apart and was a part of restoring them at eight. We look at our kids and go, at eight, my kid is like, Minecraft. I've got one. But do we believe that God can work in us in such a way and work in our kids in such a way that men, they can be a part of like this kingdom thing and actually do something? But if we don't have that expectancy of God to do that, then how are we going to be watching for that? If we don't have expectancy for God to be moving in our families, why would we, why, why would we be watching for him to move in our families? He's just going to move in my life. Listen, we saw this last week, man, that it is entirely possible to be a person that has the appearance of godliness and deny like the power of God. We can live like with this, like this godly outward look, like we can have the churchy stuff down, man, we can, we can do all of the right things, and, but yet we can still miss out on watching God actually work. We saw that in, in Timothy, right? Having the appearance of, of godliness and denying its power. Listen, I think it is entirely possible that well-intentioned Christian families can indeed have the appearance of godliness, but actually live with no awareness or expectancy that God is working and will work in their families. But we can look like we believe that. 
We can look like it. Oh, no, God's big. He's going to work in my family. Are we watching? Are we waiting? Are we anticipating God to do that? So we're, we're, we will look at why this happens in just a few, but I want to start with some, we started like this last week. I just want to start with kind of some of those duh statements, right? Stuff that like when we sit down at Starbucks, we're going to all agree on. Like we're just like, yeah, no, that's good. God's awesome, right? We agree on this stuff. And let's just start with this. You ready? Here's, here's the first thing I want you to know. Family was God's idea. I know that you think that since you were a little girl, that you were going to get married and you're going to have a certain number of kids. You're going to have a boy. You're going to have a girl. And this one's going to do this. And this one's going to do this. Like as a man, we have dreams about that, right? Like we have these ideas. And we're like, man, this is what I have planned for us. And God's going, I need you to stop for a minute because all of this is my idea. It's not even your idea. I love to tell people when they're standing like at, at like 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 at a wedding and like you got like the the the, the man the woman they're looking at each other in each other's eyes and I look at them and I just go I know you thought this was all your plan but it's not maybe all the details that God was kind of like ah whatever but this was me I worked this I moved in this. This is my idea. And we can look at what scripture tells us, right? Like we can watch all of this, right? Like here's some things. I just want to flip through them real quick. Just, just, you can just kind of nod your head if you agree or whatever, right? But this is all biblical, right? Number one, God created people to be in relationship with one another. He created man. He created female. That's what he said. From the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. Okay? Number two. He established the actual family institution. Like what we see, what we operate in as this family, God goes, man, I did this. I created all of this. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they will no longer be two, but one flesh, which is an entirely impossibility that without God, I don't know how anybody could make it in marriage. Well, therefore, God is joined together. Let no man separate. Very clear. Ephesians 5.31, he says it again. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. All right? So we see God working. Number three, God gave us kids, you ready for this? As a gift. I know sometimes we look at it and go, what did you think, God? You thought I could handle one of these? And then he gives us two. Three. He gives his kids his gifts. Psalm 127, 3, behold, children are a heritage, a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Man, if that doesn't speak to God's gonna do something in your kids, I don't know what does. They are a heritage from him. There he is. And he said, I'm gonna put them on loan for you. Don't mess them up too bad. So he gave us these kids. Number four, he actually provided roles and responsibility to ensure that the family stays healthy. He did all of that. Problem is, is when we start veering from this and detouring from it, man, marriage becomes hard, right? Like marriage with God is hard. Marriage without God, I don't get it. Like that's, in, that's, that's just like, you're crazy. You need God in your marriage. But he tells us that. He even tells us, and I know, get ready, I know we hate this verse, but it's biblical, right? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and him himself as Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And, 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 and women, that doesn't sound as bad as what the world says it does. All right, I'm just telling you right now. In fact, there's actual mutual submission to one another. So it's not just the husband gets to come in and say, it's my way or the highway. There's mutual submission here. And hey, listen, he even puts the children in this. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents. And all the ones that need to be hearing that are out there cooking your burgers. <laughs> so at bedtime tonight, parents, you have permission to read this to them. And say, thus saith the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise, that you don't die. That's the promise. 
that you don't die. That's a pretty good one, right? So here's what I need you to understand. Big point. You ready for this? God did not create the family and then abandon us to figure out how to function as a family without him. God didn't create all of this and then step back and just say, hey, I got a great idea. Y'all figure this out. Y'all figure it out. Like that's not what God does. He doesn't create something and then just kind of bail on it for people who are broken to pieces that he knows, man, they need me more than anything. Like they, without me, they can do nothing. So he is going to be a piece of it. So here's the reality. Yes, God is working. That doesn't give you, it doesn't give you room to, be, to get off the hook. Like, so it's not just like, all right, God, this is your family. Do what you want to do. We're just going to kind of hang out here, right? Puppets on a string? No. That's not how he's designed us. He's actually called us to be functioning components of this with him going, God, what do you want this to look like? God, how are you working? God, how are you moving? God, I want to see that so I can know how I'm supposed to be moving. God, I want to follow you. I want to walk with you. Because this is what's important right here. God has begun the work and he continues to work in our families. I mean, we know that Philippians 1, 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. Family was a pretty good work that he started, and he's going to complete that. He is still in the process of doing that. But I want to camp out at Psalm 127 for just a second. And I want you to listen to this. You ready? You can follow along with me, Psalm 127. He says this, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless... The Lord builds the house, those who labor, those who build it labor in vain, unless the Lord watches over the city. The watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, and he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. But man, how critical is it for us to understand that unless the Lord builds the house, man, those who build it labor in vain. Unless God is in it, It's vanity. Unless God is working in it. Now that, like I said, doesn't leave you off the hook. But here's what I need you to understand. It is God's working that actually makes our work meaningful. God working and us operating underneath, man, our shepherd as he leads us is what allows us to say, man, this is what God wants me to do and this is not in vain. I'm just not swinging my fist in the air hoping that it hits something, but it is me going, God, you're actually working this and God, I'm a part of what you're doing. If God is not working, then our labor is in vain. Listen to me, you ready for this? It's gonna be the best marriage piece of advice I can give you. If you are building your marriage, it's going to fail. If it's you that's in charge. If you're the one that is trying to make it work without God's hands being all over it, showing you, leading you, guiding you, directing you. If your eyes are not up watching for him as he leads you, then you're just gonna be doing all of the work. And he tells us, unless God's doing it, man, we're labored in vain. Listen, you can make it for a little while, but eventually you're gonna be too tired and God is gonna be the only one that is gonna sustain your marriage. God is gonna be the only one that is gonna sustain your family. End of discussion. That's it. So if God's not a part of that, it wouldn't surprise me if your marriage is struggling. I mean, we can make that assumption, right? I think so. If we're doing it all, it's going to fail. So the question that we have to ask is, so what does it look like? What does that look like? 
What does it look like for us to have our eyes up, walking and living in such a way that, man, we are watching, we're waiting, we're anticipating, we're expecting all of it? What does that look like? Man, I want, I want to take us to another Old Testament story. Man, it was really crazy because I actually, man, started this in my Bible reading in 1 Samuel. Man, I love it. And some of you are already knowing where I'm going with this, right? Man, one of the most cool stories about a lady who is the most expectant person that I can imagine when it came to her building her family. And it was this little young lady named Hannah. I mean, Hannah, man, she, she loved God and she showed up to the temple all the time, brought her sacrifices, and, and she would come, and she would, she would worship. But here was the thing about Hannah. She was barren. She couldn't have kids. They didn't know why. She just absolutely couldn't have kids. But you know what? She wanted kids. She wanted them. And there was this time in her life where, I mean, she showed up to this temple, and y'all, she would get picked on by the, the priests. <laughs> <laughs> they were horrible. Laughing at her, making fun of her. And she would just come back and she would just relentlessly come before the Lord and just pray. Y'all, she prayed so hard one time that like Eli sees her and, and was like, what is wrong with you? Like you need to get out. Like you're crazy, woman. No, that's prayer when someone looks at you and says, you're crazy. You're praying in such a way that others are looking at you and just going, are you drunk? But that was the assumption here. But what she was, was eager. She was yearning. She was expecting. She was coming to the Lord going, God, I'm bringing this to you because you are the only one who's going to be able to do anything about this. So I come to you and I'm watching and I'm waiting. God, would you work? And there was one particular trip that she made to worship and she made her sacrifice and she had encountered it. it changed the whole course of her family. And I just want to read this. So read along with me in 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 10. It says this, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the action, the afflictions of your servant and remember me, not forgetting your servant, but will give to your servant uh, a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli looked to her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered her, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made in him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And they went back to their house at, at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Here's my question. Why do we not have expectations like that? Why do we not anticipate God working like that? Why? Listen, I, I've got five reasons why I think we do. And I just want to kind of run through these real quick. Kind of like we did last week, right? I just want you to hear these. I want you to see them and, and just kind of go, man, is that why I have struggle seeing God? Number one, I think the biggest struggle that we face is that we struggle with being self-reliant. Why do we not anticipate, man, God working? Why do we not anticipate him moving? Why do we not come with him like praying and asking, God, we need you to do what only you can do. And I think it's because we're self-reliant. We so often live in such a way that we don't have to depend on anyone for anything. We don't have to ask God to do anything. Why? Because I've got this. Like, why would we ask God for the plan that he has for our family? Because we have a plan for our family. We know what that plan's supposed to look like. We know how that's supposed to operate. We know what this is supposed to be like. And we don't look to God to say, God, what can you do in my family? Because we actually don't want him to, because that would mess up our plans. 
And here's the problem with that. Man, if that as parents or if that as a husband and a wife, man, if that becomes your mantra and that's kind of how you see fit to do things, then here's the reality. You're building self-reliant kids. Actually, you're building codependent kids to depend solely on you and to have no desire to seek after God himself. Why do they need God? They have you. That's a scary statement. Why would we point them to God? Because we actually want them to look at us. We want them to hear what we think. Because we actually think what we got is actually pretty good. And it may not be horrible. It just may not be what he wants. So we're self-reliant. Number two, we walk overwhelmed. Y'all, our families have so much going on in them right now, it's hard to look for God, right? We're overwhelmed by schedules. We're overwhelmed by activities. We're overwhelmed by like events they have to go to. We're overwhelmed with them having to get up at a certain time, be somewhere at a certain time, picked up at a certain time, go to bed at a certain time, all to start over the next day. We're overwhelmed by it. We're overwhelmed by everything that has taken place in our hearts. And here's the reality. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed by all of it. Adding God to that picture and trying to figure out how to make God part of that picture, that's just another thing to be overwhelmed with, isn't it? God, I'm so overwhelmed by everything else. Can you just back up for just a minute? Because if I have to add time for you, I don't know what I'm going to cut time out of to find it. So we're overwhelmed. Number three, I I mean, I think this one just kind of speaks for itself. I think we're oblivious. We just don't even think about God working in our spouses or our kids. We just have no idea of that. Number four, we're fearful We don't want to acknowledge God working in our family because it might get in the way of what we think and want. We're afraid that it actually might rock the boat. God, if if I seek you and ask for you to do something, oh, what if you ask me to do something I don't want to do? Like, what if you really make me give you my kid? Some of you are like, he could have him. but we're fearful. If God starts working in my kid and I don't really see God working in me, what happens when my kid starts asking questions I don't know how to answer? What happens when my kids start challenging me on things that I don't want to be challenged on by my eight-year-old, my 13-year-old, my 16-year-old, my wife, We're fearful. Number five, ooh, hold your breath. We don't look for God because we're culturally influenced. Problem is, is we don't need God to speak because we got Insta moms, Facebook dads that tell us everything that we need to hear. Let's figure out there. I'll ask my Facebook moms, like, how should I discipline my kids? And the reality is, is what they say. We just like, we're like, yeah, sounds great. Just love them to death. We're so consumed with the social culture when it comes to our families. That's why we post all the pretty pictures on it. We want everybody else to think that our family's got it all figured out and we're all together. If we're more consumed by that, then how in the world are we ever gonna be expecting of God to actually do something? How are we gonna go seeking him to actually do the work and us to follow along with what he's doing? Psalm 127, one, I bring it up again. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. So the question we have to ask is what does it look like to live with expectancy? Man, we got this beautiful picture of Hannah. Here's her prayer. Hey, God, if you give me a son, guess what I'll do? Man, I'll I'll give him back. He's yours. He's yours. 
What do we learn from Hannah? What do we learn that we need to look at in our own lives? You ready? Hold on fast. Here we go. Number one, if we're going to be an expectant people, if we're going to be a people who are watching God and waiting for God and anticipating God to move in our families, you ready for this? Number one, we will make God our first priority. I know that sounds like such a pastoral thing to say, right? God's got to be number one. But there's no other way, right? Listen, if God's not number one, you ready for this? Something else is. If God's not number one, something else is. In your life and in your family's life. If God's not number one, something else is. Listen, Hannah had a deep dependency upon God as the only source. She comes back and she's just like pouring out her soul. God, you're the only one that can do that. You're the only one. God, I come to you. Here's my offering. Here's my worship. Here's my prayer. And I surrender this right here because you're it. The difference between Hannah and us is this. We have great intentions for God to be number one, but then all of a sudden number two, three, and four are great options as well. God, you're my first pick until number two looks really good in that moment. And then we're just like, eh, maybe that'll work too. Number three, that's yeah, pretty good. Love the Lord your God and serve him only. You shall have no other gods before him, including your kids, including your spouses. If they come before God, they're idols. I can't put it any other way. I know they're really cute idols, but we can't love them more than God. I was talking to Carson the other day and I said, who do you love more, me or mom? He's like, dad, you know I love you both the same. I said, who do you love more, me or Jesus? It's a great pastoral trick right there, right? Who do you love more, me or Jesus? Uh, uh, I said, son, it is okay for you to tell me every day that I love Jesus more than you. I want him to be number one in his life. Way more valuable than me. Let me, let me can, I, can I speak to people who are married with no kids right now? You want them, but you don't have them right now. If God's not number one in your marriage right now, do not think that having a kid is automatically gonna put him at number one. But I hear lots of people that are like, we have a kid now. He needs to love Jesus. Listen, if God's not number one in your marriage, he's not gonna be number one in your family. So it starts now. Hey, listen, if you're not married right now and you want to be married someday, let me just speak to you for a second. If God's not number one in your life, then you're not going to find a guy who's got God as number one in his life, and so therefore God's not going to be number one in y'all's life. So God's not going to be number one in your family. So it starts there, okay? Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13 says this, and you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you aren't seeking him with all your heart, it may be hard for you to find him but you need it. Number two, we will be praying, believing that God can do what he says he can do. All Hannah knew what to do is this right here. God, I'm gonna worship and pray. I'm just gonna bring it to your feet. I'm gonna bring it to your feet. God, I don't know what else to do. I'm bringing it to you. God, you're in charge. God, you can do this. God, here's what I'm asking. God, here it is. God, this is what I would love for you to do. And God, if you do this, God, this is what I'm gonna do. But God, I lay this at your feet. Listen, God understands our prayer. God, my marriage sucks right now. He gets that. God, it's just so hard to deal with these kids that you gifted me. God, I am so wore out from all the things that are on my to-do list. God, I'm exhausted. I don't think there's anything wrong with those prayers, but can I tell you the difference between that prayer and Hannah's prayer? You ready for this? Hannah prayed a prayer knowing that it was gonna cost her something. Hannah prayed knowing that if God answered, it was gonna cost her. And she prayed it anyway.
If we are not praying constantly and courageously, we might not be living with expectancy that God can and will work in our family. If we're not praying courageously and constantly, then we might not be living with expectation that God can work. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Y'all, this is just the words of Jesus. That's just Jesus talking. God in the flesh. How much more will God give those who ask? God, my marriage is awful. God, what do you want me to do? God, what do I need to work on? God, would you lead me? Would you carve out of me the flesh? God, my agenda has got me so booked. God, what do I need to give up? God, my kid needs Jesus. God, my kid needs like you to wreck his life. God, I know you can answer me. What does it look like to pray that? Number three. We're gonna surrender our family to the plans and the purpose of God. That's what Hannah did. Just listen, ready? That Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an F of a flower, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and then they brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives he is lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there don't any of y'all leave your kids here today (laughs) here God here I'll ask Caleb to come up. How often do we pray for God? God, I just want to get married. God, I want a kid. And then after recognizing his grace and his blessing, we take it as our own and we just make it what we want it to be. God. Here's my kid. God, here's my spouse. God, here's our family. Those of you know this, my son struggles with epilepsy. We have no idea why. It's the most difficult thing as a parent to watch. As he's getting older, he wants to drive, he wants to do life. The only thing I have to do is to say, God, he's yours and you love him way more than me. You love him more than I do. And I forget, he asked me one day, he said, Dad, what if I have a seizure in this situation? I said, son, that could be real bad. So it could be real bad. I said, that's why we got to be surrendered to Jesus. And that's why I lay you on the throne regularly and just say, God, 
He's yours. He's yours. The last and final thing is this. We're going to trust that God will do what he says he does, and what he does is absolutely perfect. We're going to trust that. We're going to trust it. God, you're good, and what you do is perfect, and I'm going to believe that. Do you trust God with your life? Do you trust God with your spouse? Do you trust God with your kids? Do you trust him with your family? Do you trust him? My guess is, is that somewhere in this mix, we found that there are things that we're doing that keep us from seeing him. Self-reliant, overwhelmed, fearful. And we recognize there's some things that maybe we need to, to think about. So our response this morning is confession. And confession is not, God, I'm a terrible parent. God, my kid is horrible. It's not your prayer. Your prayer this morning may need to begin with this. God, I confess that you're not number one. Show me what I need to lay at your feet. Maybe your prayer is, God, I confess that I don't pray believing that you can do what you say you can. Help me to pray continuously and courageously. God, I confess that I take your blessings and do what I want with them. Strengthen me as I surrender them all to you. God, I confess that I don't always trust you. Will you grow my faith by helping me see? So we're going to have a time of prayer before we go do baptisms and have fun. But I'm going to invite you to actually do business with God. And this morning, your business may be that you need to sit there with your spouse, maybe your kids. Confess, this is why I struggle. I don't put God number one. And then y'all pray. Man, what a great opportunity it'd be for us to do that. I'll ask you just to bow your heads for a moment. I don't know how you need to move. We're gonna have some prayer people right over here. We got some elders, some ministry leaders, prayer partners. If you need to pray with somebody, that'd be great. Your spouse is right beside you too, maybe. Just gonna do business for a minute, okay? So if you need to get up and move, get up and move. Nobody's gonna judge you. How do you need to pray this morning? How do you need to ask God to move so that you can be expected in what He's doing?
have to do this alone. In fact, if you want to see life change take place, it's going to happen when we agree with one another, when we agree with God, asking Him to work, walking with one another. Pray for us. Okay. We're not leaving just yet. You got plenty of opportunity just to come up to someone and say, hey, here's where I'm struggling. Father, we do. We trust you. And we know that you're moving and working. Father, help us to be expectant of that. Help us to anticipate to watch and wait for you expectantly, urgently, eagerly, trusting you. I thank you for our people here today, Lord. God, we love you so much.